Well, welcome to the Audubon Country Club podcast. Today, this is going to be a very interesting podcast, I believe. We're joined with James Keck, who, where are you today, James? Uh, I'm in Houston right now. In Houston. Okay. Awesome. I'm uh, pretty far, I'm in um, Puerto Rico right now looking out at the, uh, out the, out at the ocean. So I've had to close the door to keep the uh, ocean noise out, but uh Race cars in the background is always a good a good background noise too. But uh, today uh, we are going to talk about something fairly unique. I'm an old guy, so uh, you're pretty young. So um, anyway, well, first of all, uh, you uh, so I talked to Mike Gritter. I guess you you um, started karting out at the out at the club. Did you do some karting out at the country club? Yeah, so I'm in Houston right now, but born and raised in Joliet. So been been going to the Audubon Country Club, I think, since it's open. My, my parents, Jim and, and Debbie Keck, were uh, members there very early on. So going out there, you know, whether that's, you know, just riding dirt bikes, kind of causing a ruckus when I was a little kid amongst the members, or um, when I started to get older, yeah, I had a little little cart I used to take out and then uh, kind of graduated to take until my, my dad's carts, uh, cars out. And I even uh, worked there over a couple summers as, as a, a corner worker. So, kind of, I think I know know the Audubon um, from a lot of different aspects. Oh, very good, very good. And so, uh, just a, a quick little background. So, after Joliet, um, your, your dad, I spoke with him a couple weeks ago. He he gave me just a little bit of background, but kind of fill us in on what you've been doing since since the corner worker days. Yeah. Yeah, a, a, a lot actually, but I guess professionally, uh, how it pertains to what we're talking about today, um, I, after I graduated uh, college, I started working for Accenture Technology, really looking at, you know, the next wave of technology as related to big businesses. So, you know, your Walmarts, your Shell Oils, your Fords, your GMs of the world, you know, how do they make sense of the latest and greatest technology out there? Um, how do we communicate that to them? And then likewise, how do we actually start building stuff that make sense to them that could provide some value so that was my job that was my, my kind of life after college um, for the past four four or five years now and, and then from there they introduced me to a lot of different technologies and that's kind of what brought me to my current venture and projects um, i'd love to accenture kind of start my own blockchain consulting or blockchain technology company and then from there uh, i have a couple projects the main one being modal block which we're going to talk about today yeah okay so <laughs> Uh, I tried to explain it. My wife has asked me, uh, coincidentally, several times to explain blockchains to her. Um, digital currency, I've, I've done my best. Uh, I remember when my buddy in 2011 said, hey, we need to buy some computers and start mining for Bitcoin. Uh, boy, I should have listened to him. Boy, right? Um, that would have been a good time to get started. Uh, anyway, so... Uh, blockchains are generally associated with cryptocurrency, which is cryptocurrency being a digital currency, the most famous one being Bitcoin. Uh, but there are multiple, multiple uh, digital currencies. And explain a little bit what exactly a blockchain is. Yeah, yeah. Well, and I appreciate you asking that. Instead of jumping into all, all the hype that's been around NFTs now, which I think is a relatively technical thing, and, and and you started to hit the nail on the head where you know cryptocurrencies is just a use case of blockchain technology. But as I as I explain it, and for the common person, really the best way to look or easiest way to understand blockchain technology is to look at it as a shared digital record, a record that anyone can trust and essentially no one can mess with. And with that record, you could do, there's a bunch of different use cases, such as one being cryptocurrency, because it's a shared record. So you can see, you know, if I own this currency or you own that amount, um, that's shared and that's trusted. Um, and then there's, there's a bunch of different use cases, whether that's tracking something on a supply chain, because it's a shared record again, or to what Motoblock does, where it's a unique collectible. Again, there's a shared record of that ownership of that identity. Um, so you can collect it, you can own it, and, and so forth. But there's, there's a whole kind of gamut, a whole spectrum of what can be a record. Uh, but essentially what blockchain technology does, it, it creates a, a way to share it and a, and a way to share it securely and a way to share that record in a trustworthy manner. Yeah, so to um, 
maybe to just touch qu- quickly on uh w- we'll use bitcoin for example often bitcoin gets talked about as being uh, anonymous and no one can track it that's exactly not what a blockchain does and or what bitcoin does every single transaction that from the moment the bitcoin is mined that's another conversation i guess uh every movement of that amount percentage right now fraction of percent of the bitcoin is tracked now it's not anonymous other than it is moved associated with numbers so uh, i'm sorry say that again pseudonymous or there's a pseudonym that you know it's uh, yes but but it but it's not just randomly moved everything is everything is tracked so a blockchain, for example, I, I, I like to use, I was using us flying an airplane today and uh, the other pilot and I were talking about this. And for example, I see a perfect use of blockchain is all the maintenance records for an aircraft. Yep. So that aircraft, um, every single maintenance record from the time it leaves the factory is logged on a blockchain and that can never be changed, can never be tampered with, can never be lost. And... Um, uh, I have a couple other uses in my mind I've been kicking around, but not what we're going to talk about today. That I didn't think of that, but <laughs> but um, so the the and how a blockchain works and why it can never be lost. Uh, you want to explain why why it's so secure and why and eventually I think every transaction, every financial transaction, will be tracked with a blockchain. It just has to be, I would think. Uh, but uh, how come nothing? How come this can be so secure and it can never be lost? Yeah, well, first of all, you're already pretty advanced, I guess, in your understanding in that use case you gave. I was actually one that I can, um, I'm confident it's already being built out right now with some of my, my, my previous job and some companies we used to work with. But, uh, and that's another great example. But kind of what makes, you know, blockchain so trustworthy and secure and what gets put on it is that this may get a little technical, but look of it as a, you know, an additional layer to the internet we have today, you know, kind of an add on, um, except that this layer is decentralized. Um, so not one person can control it, not one person can mess with it, but anyone can contribute to it and anyone can verify a record on it. Anyone can check a record. On it. And what kind of goes down to the security aspect of, of it is each record that's created, um, it's cryptographically secured. So it's, it, there's a whole huge cryptographic security and key that you need to essentially hack to to figure it out or to make it unsecure. Um, a, a good analogy we used to use was, imagine taking a chicken nugget from McDonald's and then making a chicken out of it again. You know, th- th- that's essentially what, what, what cryptography does to any type of record. It jumbles it up and, and, and it has a bunch of different keys and passwords and, and kind of layman's terms where the average computer program or the average what system can't unhack it or can't corrupt it. And, and that's essentially kind of the underpinnings of why it's so secure. But again, I think the main value is that it, that's really kind of a shared record. Um, and that's why people can trust it. Right. So shared record means so how, how um, so once a Bitcoin is mined, for example, to go back to Bitcoin, it, once a Bitcoin is mined, it's a long string of numbers mathematically derived. That's how you get it. But anyway, so it's a long string of numbers. And every time that that Bitcoin or section of that, Bitcoin gets moved or added to the chain. The reason why it's called the chain is information continues to be added to it. Mm-hmm. And the reason, help me out here because I'm going to struggle with this, but so uh, there are people who have a bunch of computers that could have one computer, I suppose. In the old days, it was one computer, but many have a bunch of computers. And every time that, every time that a, um, anything is added or, or you spend, for example, in, in this Bitcoin thing, you spend a Bitcoin, someone out there adds to the Bitcoin, they verify that this is yours, or at least coming from this, yours being this, as you mentioned, this pseudo name, right? It comes that that's part that you own that we're going to add to that blockchain and they get a small uh, transaction fee to add to it, to verify and add to it. Correct? Yeah. Yeah. For Bitcoin specifically, that's how it works. So it's kind of a, a community that's, you know, maintaining that record and then a community that's verifying it. And then if, you know, you contribute, you know, 
your power or your computing power, or essentially you, your computer to help verify those transactions or to make sure those records are secure and safe, then you get a reward and that's a percentage of, of a Bitcoin or it. A fraction of per percent oh, nowadays, right? Now. <laughs> yeah, very small fraction of percent. So all the blockchain, so the only way to get rid of a blockchain would be to destroy every single computer in the world because there's multiple so that's it's the reason it's so secure is it's not stored in uh it's not stored in uh fort knox for example um it's stored in a gazillion computers all over the place yep yep and and you just need two of those to or you're right you just need one of them to maintain or to be you know working for it to maintain that whole ledger or that whole record so um when we talk about um uh, other type of blockchains. So let's say, go back to my airplane analogy. If we're analogy, if we're going to keep keep all this information on a on a for aircraft maintenance, is everybody who's verifying that is that still going to be one computer? I, I mean, I understand how this the Bitcoin thing because people are trying to make money. But even if we put this on a blockchain, how does that get? We're, we're going to wrap this up to come back to your thing, Motoblock here. But so, how how does that get verified? How are how are people adding to that blockchain, getting paid, or what's their incentive to keep do, to keep doing that? Well, it, for for some of those cases, for example, the airplane records, at least from from my professional experience, and what would happen is there's not necessarily a financial incentive as far as getting a reward. Um, there, de there definitely is, and it de depends on what kind of, I should say, blockchain or what system they choose to put that record on. Um, but, but there's also incentive if you're in that community or if you're in that that blockchain network, if you will, um, to, you know, it's the same incentive that you get as in maintaining the trust, maintaining the transactions, maintaining um, that that record of truth between everyone. Uh, which is why you would kind of keep on contributing to it um, and keep on maintaining it. But but that that's more of a specific to to your use case. But for the for the general public, for everyone else, um, th th there's still a financial incentive or there's there's a reward that people get for helping maintain that record, for helping maintain whichever blockchain that they want to contribute to and support. Okay. So now, now on no, to th those are some very detailed questions. It's, it's more it's more or less a master course of, of blockchain <laughs> technology, which I wasn't expecting. But I mean, I I, I can um, I can go in those as in detail as you want. But I I kind of want to make make uh, sure uh, people don't glaze all, over this from all the technical. Well, aspects. I told I told Mike Gritter at the track the the um, uh, race director to track this week. I said this might be the most technical um, uh, podcast that we do. But I wanted to lay some foundation because as I'm discussing this with my wife, she can't not, she cannot wrap her head around it. And so, um, I wanted to give some, a little bit of a background on how, uh, the basis for what the, the blockchain technology, which now goes into the N F T's, which you mentioned, which is another, uh, interesting new acronym that I didn't hear until, uh, I asked my 16 year old son about it. Um, so, uh, what exactly is an NFT? Yeah. So that's actually a very technical term within itself. And some term when we started motor block that we didn't even want to market or even tire tire name to be associated with, but NFT means the very literal definition is a non fungible token. So I, I think to understand that first, we, we already kind of we already started to understand blockchain technology, or at least we, we try to, as in it's essentially a, a shared record across the internet, almost a new version um, of the internet where people can trust what they put in, um, put into it, and can verify what comes out of it. So then, if we kind of take the next step further to NFT, which is something that's built on on top of blockchain, the non fungible token, I think right before we do that, we have to understand what's fungible and non fungible. So a good example I use is, you know, something that's fungible is something that's interchangeable, something that's not unique. So for example, I have a $5 bill, you have a $5 bill, I can give you mine, you can give me yours, we can still go buy a crap ton of Taco Bell at the end of the day with that $5 bill, it, hold, it still holds the same value, there's no unique aspect to it, like I need mine or you need yours to go throughout your day or do whatever that $5 bill was designed for. So that's, that's fungible, you know, it's interchangeable, not unique. Now, when you shift gears to non-fungible, 
that essentially just means something that's unique. So non-fungible means you can't interchange it with anything else. Uh, so for example, our passports or a driver's license. Yeah, there may be multiple passports and driver license out there, but the ones with our name on them, with our record, are unique to us. I can't, if I get pulled over, I can't give them your driver's license, even though I would, I would want to give over anyone else's, you know, <laughs> but, but, but it, it, it's not going to work. You know what I mean? And, and that's tied to us. That's unique to us. And, and in that case, you know, that passport, that driver's license would be non-fungible. And essentially, if we kind of put all that together, a non-fungible token, that just means a unique record on the blockchain or a non-fungible record on the blockchain. Okay, so now your new, um, very interesting, uh, how do we want to call it? I don't want to call it a website because it's more than that. I don't want to call it a, a business. You reference it as a game, I think, on your website. So how do you, <laughs> what do you, Motoblock, M-O-T-O-B-L-O-Q. Yes, sir. Okay. Motoblock. Uh, what is it? So... What Mortal Block is, is we took the whole concept behind an NFT and we decided, you know, something that we want to make unique, something that we want to have people to own and to kind of create value is cars, um, but digital cars. So think of it as the evolution of Hot Wheels or Matchbox cars, where now people can go and they co collect their favorite cars, whether that's from their favorite car manufacturer, a concept artist, or maybe other influencers in the car world they can now have the opportunity to own that car. And it's digital, it's unique to them. That ownership is verified and recorded given everything we just talked about with the online technology. And now they can trade it, they can collect it, they can start to really kind of have a whole new digital asset of a car. That, right, a digital, so you can see it. Yeah. Uh, you can't drive it. Not yet. <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> um, so it's a, a, a unique car. So it, recently, so we're recording this on the 6th of April. So recently there's been massive amount of, it's a multi-million, hundred million dollar, um, I don't say business, but a, a area of blockchain, we'll say, yep. or area of, of uh, non-fungible tokens. Um so there's a there has been a lot most famous if anybody's heard of this most famous is the first uh tweet from Jack Dorsey sold for uh, so someone owns that first tweet and only that one person uh, another one is a famous um uh digital drawing that sold recently for multiple millions of dollars also so there's a lot of interesting things coming to the forefront as far as I know, this is the first uh, co car collection, uh, we might say, um, to be uh, enter that fray. I don't know if that's true, but I'm going to go with that right now because that's the only one I know about. And uh, <laughs> so uh, I, I, I love, I love, I love the idea. And uh, so I'm just sitting here on a say Sunday, and I say I want to add to my digital car collection. I go over to um, Motoblock. Well, what is the status right now? I think it's a, a unique status I, I noticed uh, from your website. So so what is the status? So you have a website you can go to and you can learn more about this. You can read about it. There's some questions you get answered and kind of some of the background. Um, hopefully uh, this podcast answers a lot of those questions uh, and fulfills part of that um, need for information to go participate in it. So right now, what's the status of the website, or what what are you're doing? What are you doing now with the cars? Yeah, so right now we're in our presale. We're we're in our fourth. We're about to start our fourth out of four presales, where users can go on, view a, a minimal version of the car, uh, just an image of the car. There's a lot more once we actually go live um, for them to buy, but they can go and they can reserve their spot in line to then purchase the car when the marketplace and when the whole application is live for them to purchase and transact and trade. And so, yeah, so go and purchase. So you're, so right now you're basically standing in line outside of an Apple store ready to go in to buy the new, Correct. the latest iPhone kind yep. of, right? right? And uh, the different thing is I'm assuming once you get in there, uh, you, 
the Motoblock sets the price uh, initially of the car? Yeah, yeah. So m- most of our cars, and we've also been working with some concept artists as well in the automotive design space. So people who have a, a huge following for making, you know, concepts or you know, car renders. So already digital renders of cars, and they haven't had an outlet to actually list their cars or have people collect their um, creations. So we've been working with artists along with we've been creating our own cars as well for manufacturers, and, it, it, and exactly that uh, we set the for the cars that we create uh, originally, we set the price. And then the cars that we have from artists, we work with them to kind of set a price with them as well. And of course, they enter, they enter a percentage. But yes, we kind of we work together with um, the team that we curate the cars with. We set the price, the initial price. After you bought buy it from Motoblock, then it's an open marketplace. So whether you want to sell your car for quadruple the money or you want to sell it for a dollar, that's on you. We and given again kind of the underlying technology we have no control over that. So it's really, you know, we have the initial say in what gets on the platform, but after that it's, 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 it's open to whoever and, and whenever. So uh, the transaction, so uh, what would be an example, give me an example of a car that uh, um, a 55 year old guy here wants to buy looking at the ocean. So what, what kind of car would I want to buy, for example? I don't know, maybe a Volkswagen dune buggy if you're around the beach. Okay. All right. Sorry, a Volkswagen dune buggy, right? So we have this Volkswagen dune buggy that uh, I buy initially a rough price. What would that be? What would that be? You guys would set a, a rough price. I'm not going to hold you to that, but I'm just just, just uh, uh, throwing that out there. You probably don't have a Volkswagen dune buggy, do you, in the, in the well, collection? Well, it, it, it's on the list. It's on the <laughs> okay. List. So- <laughs> it's definitely on the list. So, well, one thing with how we set the prices and also a big thing is the quantity of cars as well. Um, they're all based out of real world or the actual production numbers of the car. So we take a percentage of the current value of the cars along with the actual production number of the cars. So cars that were mass produced, let's say over 100, we just take a percentage of those cars. So, you know, we don't flood the marketplace or we don't have a surplus of cars. And we, so we don't lose that, you know, collectability of it. Um, but then let's say it's a rare car like the McLaren F1, where there's only, I think, 11 made. Uh, we would put all 11 of those on it because that's such a relatively rare car. It would, wouldn't make sense to do a percentage of that. Um, but so that's how we kind of determine the quantity. And it's the same reason with the price. So we do 0.1% of the actual, you know, suggested, you know, current value of the cars. So. You know, a Bugatti, you know, we have a Bugatti that got reserved for $3,000, but then we have my one of my favorites, one of my cars, a Ford Ranchero, that we had on there for $13. So so it's really, we try to, even though it's, for some people may think it's, you know, it's it's all foo-foo and it's, and it's, it's all kind of up in the air, we do try to root a lot of how we display the cars, how we sell the cars, and how we create the cars in real-world numbers. So I get into your website, I make an account, and... I say, I'm going to buy the Ford Ranchero. Love that car, too. When I was a kid, uh, the, the Dave Witt's neighbor had one that had a huge blower. I mean, massive blower on the thing. Oh, my God. You could hear it. It sounded like a jet engine coming. The, blow, the holes. I mean, it must have been this. Anyway, when I was, that was a cool car, especially when I was a kid. So I buy for, uh, you said, $13. So I log into your website. I buy it from you for $13. What kind of money do you take? Uh, do you take... Um, Real money, or as I think, actually, I think on your website you call it fiat money, which is exactly what it is, right? Fiat money, so uh, a treasury note from the Federal Reserve, or I can pay in uh, a digital currency, perhaps. Yeah, a- anything. So, so, and that's one thing that for most consumers may seem, you know, inherent. You know, the ability to pay in anything, um, but whether it's you know your credit card through PayPal or you want to buy it through with Bitcoin or Ethereum or whatever your favorite cryptocurrency is, any major um, fiat currency, any major cryptocurrency we support. So, and, and one thing we've been developing very hard is the ability where to buy you know, and to collect and to be a user on Motoblock is as easy as buying something on Nike or on Amazon. Um, because one thing you know, in this whole crypto world or this whole NFT world specifically, there's a lot of kind of self-management that users have to go through. They have to have a password for like their wallets and their keys, and then they have to have an account for the actual website. It becomes very complicated. It gets people disinterested. And our kind of, one of our missions from the get-go was to have this 
appeal to more of the mass adoption. So everyone from the little kid who wants to collect that brand new Lamborghini to, to that guy uh, on the beach who wants that, that dune bugger, that ranchero. We really want to make it as easy as possible for everyone to get involved in the space and start collecting our cars. Right. Don't lose your password to your crypto wallet. I have many stories I've had, or have funny stories, some funny stories, some interesting, some sad stories. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> so don't lose, don't lose your password or your paper wallet, uh, et cetera. So, well, case, but, but to, to be clear, Motobock take, takes care of all that. So, so if, for, for example, you do lose a password to your account, you go through the same kind of password reset services that you would on any website. And we have a very secure way. We actually have um, a private blockchain where we store stuff. So it's, it's almost overkill for the security and knock, knock on wood. Um, and, and then we also integrate with, with a public blockchain as well. So, so there's multiple records of it. And we really try to main, take, take out all that mess of having a paper wall and all the stuff where some people probably listen now are like, what in the heck? Are we what are we talking about? about? <laughs> <laughs> See me at the track. Uh, um, I found a paper wall one time in the bottom of my, uh, uh, computer bag and I said oh my wife said something don't you have some bitcoin or something left over in some paper wallet and I went and found it and it was all shredded and been oh, carrying it around for years <laughs> uh, I was able to salvage it but uh, anyway um, so I buy the Ranchero for $13 if I sell it to producer Mark say producer Mark wants to buy it for $15 mm -hmm. do I sell it only inside of Motoblock to him does he have to be a Motoblock user for me to sell it to him Initially, yes, but but on our roadmap is to expand to there's a bunch of other marketplaces. Let's say there, there's eBay's for NFTs, if you will, and, and, and given it's that again that going back to that public record, that trusted record, um, you can take the cars bought on Motoblock and you can take that to whatever marketplace you want and you can sell it openly. Um, so, uh, like I said, we only control that initial purchase. After that, it's 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 free reigns. Which, in my mind now, I think, okay, so if I don't sell it in Motoblock and I sell it to producer Mark for $26, because I know he's going to want that Ford Ranchero, and uh, I don't sell it to Motoblock, how does, how does one, is it j just, I, I go to, uh, just like I do now, if I want to, Ethereum is also another type of digital currency, the one that I have used the most of. So if I want to buy something with Ethereum, I, you know, I put my long chain in there i go someplace and i said i want to transfer it to this person and they give me a is it 54 character 56 characters 54 characters 56 yeah 56 characters and i say hey, i want to send my blockchain to this 56 character person because that person gave it to me so mark would have to do the same thing he'd have to give me 56 characters if i did it outside of motorblock 56 characters and then i would transfer it to him that that same similar type of way Correct. Yes, that's how it work. At least for the time being. Again, the technology is evolving. That's one reason we want to kind of we started with Motoblock and to I guess, take care of that problem um, for people is because of that whole transfer process. But yeah, that's, it, that's it, how it work. Yeah, I'm sure other people's heads also just went. What? I have 56 characters for me to send something to somebody. Right, it's it's nerve, easier right? than it sounds. It's easier than it sounds, right? <laughs> It's just copy and paste, but it, but it is kind of nerve wracking, you know, large quantities. Uh, so, uh, so now, how how unique? I know we talked about the uniqueness of um, uh, Motoblox cars. There's a certain number of cars that that you will have. What's the uniqueness to say? Um, how how do you separate from, uh, you know, someone else? you know, starting another car collecting side. Do you have exclusivity with some cars uh, just through your side? How, how do you, how, how does the uniqueness of yours as being first and, and of course the best, um, uh, how, how does that uniqueness transfer to that? Or is there a uniqueness involved in it? No, that, that's a good question. That's, that's kind of the fundamental question that we answer every day and that we're working towards for our business on the business side. Um, and and it, it's a combination of stuff. So yes, we're, we're one of the first markets or the first market with brand name cars. There's something else out there that does more concept cars, um, cars that, you know, they kind of just create um, out of nowhere. But our, yeah, our, our, the uniqueness is A, being first to market, but then more importantly is we're already in talks with major car manufacturers um, to have licensing and official cars. <laughs> 
on Motoblock. So their first official digital car will be through Motoblock. In addition to, I touched base on, on the earlier, we're working with these digital artists. So people who have huge followings across the internet, across social media, that create these concepts. You know, cars that never were created or should have been, or they do a spin, they'll have a, someone did a, a Ferrari 250 GTO, they made it into a low rider. You know what I mean? And some people hate it, some people love it. Um, but, you know, it's these cars that live in the whole digital format that people had no ability or avenue to collect prior to. So we're kind of working with on both of those avenues. A, to have kind of the official name brand cars on here, license on here, as well as bring a different aspect, a whole new side of car community with kind of these artists and kind of these underground um, concepts and provide a platform that people can collect them and enjoy them and trade them as well. So how does the, the, the are, are cars trademarked? Are these, are, are, is a Ford Ranchero, is that trademarked? Does you have to work with Ford for that? Or is that open domain to, to be able to, to do that? Like just getting a picture on, you know, I can get a picture of that car if I just search Google, you know, images. Yeah, well, yeah, I think there's, there's kind of two questions built into that. But going back to trademark, it, it depends on the car. It depends on kind of how we initially set it up. But it, it goes back to a licensing with that car manufacturer. Um, to make sure we have a license to do that and the license un unique to to Motoblock and so forth. Okay. All right. So um, what's the time frame or timetable so that I'm sure everybody's right now, they're watching this on a computer. If you're driving, listen to the podcast, wait until you stop before you go to motoblock.com, M-O-T-O-B-L-O-Q.com, and see what's going on. What's the timetable for, you said this is the uh, fourth window, um, what do you call it, so soft launch? Uh, Pre-sale. It's pre-sale. Yeah. The fourth window, when is the time frame for that to close and the site to go active and people start uh, trading cars? Yeah, so we're looking for mid-May. Um, like, like I said, we're four out of four pre-sales. Uh, I think it's been going really well. So if there's no other bumps in the road, um, which we haven't had, and we get all our manufacturers on board like we're ex expecting to um mid mid, mid may i hope i didn't say mid march mid may is, is when we'll you said may yeah that's right yeah mid may yep 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 so yeah so i mean just talking out loud here i i see right if you have the you know if motoblock has that specific licensing from the from the manufacturer i mean i that sounds pretty cool to me too w would there ever be as i've thought about this for the last couple of weeks is would there be could I buy something with a motorblock car? I mean, could I exchange it? I mean, I guess I could. Yeah. Um, do you foresee it being a digital currency, you might say, that I could go to my Coinbase thing and see motorblock on there? Or is that well, anything like that? If we kind of want to get far out, there's a whole world with using NFTs, or let's, I, I think the better term is a digital collectible, because um, NFT could really be anything. Um, but a digital <laughs> collectible, there's a whole services um, and applications designed to have those as collateral, have those, um, again, to fractionalize them. Um, and you can even use those um, to, to get a loan out with it within cryptocurrency, given it's valuable and, you know, it's on kind of those open marketplaces. So, so yeah, you could definitely use it as you would essentially any other asset. Um, you know, you would use your, your real, life, real life car as maybe collateral today. Um, you could use a highly collectible motor block car in the crypto world to do the same. But again, that, that's kind of far out, and that's not something we're going to look at right now. It's not something that you would necessarily need from us anyways if you wanted to do. Um, but it's definitely a, a, a possibility. Uh, now, I've got it. I've got a, and it. So I could go into my – I want the new Mazda Miata, and I could go in there and I could say – I'm I'm not suggesting you're saying this, but I just I'm just rolling this with my head. That's you know five years from now I go in there, ten years from now I go in there and say I want to buy that new Mazda Miata. Please take my Mazda Miata digital car uh, as a down payment, which probably I mean it could be right. It could be theoretically it could be. I, I think we're, we're we're quite a ways away from that, um, but but it could be. Uh, it, it could be. You, you can hey. do it to buy your digital house. I think a digital house, an NFT house, should sold for half a million dollars. So you could probably use it for collateral against that. <laughs> um, interesting, interesting. Well, is there any aspect of Motoblock that we didn't cover or that we wanted to explain a little bit more that I haven't, I haven't brought up? 
Yeah, I think the main thing is maybe to shed some light on the roadmap. So essentially people are like, they're probably scratching their heads, so I'm just going to go along and pay money for a, a digital image, essentially. And, and the first stage is, yeah, it's a, it's a digital image, but it's a complete render that you can interact with. Um, we'll also have augmented reality capability. Um, so I don't know if people are familiar with like Pokemon Go or the ability to kind of um, superimpose or interact with a digital car in real life, like through your phone, um, where you can kind of interact with it. Um, you could essentially you could place it, have the digital car, and you take a picture with it in your driveway and stuff like that. But but the first step mm -hmm. is it's, it's going to be a really kind of a digital collectible. Um, it, that's the first step in a roadmap. The second step is to then expand this into, I like to say, the, these other digital worlds or virtual worlds. Um, there's a whole, just as you know, we have Motoblock, there's a, a virtual world, one of them uh, is called the Central Land, where people take all these digital collectibles, all these NFTs to display them and to, and to use them. Um, you know, like, so you could take your motor black car, you could put it in this digital world. Again, it, it's far out. But I think one that's another aspect of that that's going to be very valuable for us is to take these cars and then actually use them. Um, use them as in the sense of using them in a, in a let's say, a car video game. So I, I buy my motor black car and now I can, I'm integrated with Gran Turismo or iRacing or Forza. And then you actually own this car. They can get, then go have these digital and virtual experiences with, you know, across the internet, across whatever experience or medium you, you'd want to. So, so that, that's kind of the, the long, you know, both the short, midterm and long-term roadmap, but something that I want people to understand that, you know, you're getting more than just, you know, a picture of a car, you know, I, on the pre-sale, it looks just like a picture, but once you actually get to own it, we're going to enable a bunch of features for you to interact with it, to enjoy it, to display it. And then from there, we're constantly working on growing our roadmap, growing our integrations, growing our, our partners. So it becomes useful, at least in the digital world. So can I put my um, Oculus goggles on and interact, eventually interact with my digital yeah. car? Yeah. Yep. Definitely can. <laughs> Can I drive my digital? So what do I? Uh, what's my favorite the Oculus? So an Oculus, listeners, is a uh, uh, the virtual reality goggles that you wear to play a game, interact. Um, my uh, daughter's favorite game is uh, as she cooks food at a as a cook in a diner. I suggest she could just go cook me actual food in our kitchen but she likes to actually cook in the diner and um as a short order cook you know um i prefer robo recall i think it's an outstanding game if you haven't played that uh, you uh robots are go uh rogue and then you have to go take care of them you have to recall the robots I so um i would love to be in my f1 mclaren and driving through robo recall to uh to the next uh level so that i can go take care of the bad robots <laughs> oh, and, 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 and and that is the that, that's the goal for us and like i said something that we're working every day to uh kind of to make real and, and to integrate it with platforms with games with, with partners like that outstanding how so moto block Dot com. They can go there. They can reach out to you. There's a contact form or something there. They can reach out to you. There's a contact form. If you need to reach out to me directly, it's just j at motoblock.com. Um, it's my email. And then, of course, uh, we have our social media outlets. Our Twitter is at motoblock, and our Instagram is at motoblock as well. Um, there, we what we like to do or what we have done, we've had little snippets or little kind of posts that kind of try to demystify or make sense of everything we just talked about, a little bite-sized pieces. Um, kind of give you real life analogies and examples. So I'm sure a lot of people's head are scratching right now. I encourage them to go out to some of our social media and just, you know, learn more about what we're doing and also follow our releases and, and all the great collaborations we have um, underway. Fascinating stuff. James, thanks so much for being on the Audubon Country Club podcast. I wish you and Motoblock all the success. And I look forward to seeing you at the track sometime. I'm often down by the cart track, but uh, running around. So uh, we we can meet in person, not just from uh, a quarter of the way, eighth of the way around the world or something like that. So uh, anyway, thanks again for being on the show. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. I'll have a poor ranch here waiting for you. <laughs> thanks. Take care.